so thankful this morning that we can trust you, Lord. In all things, we can trust you, Jesus. Let the Spirit of the living God come in this room. We feel your presence. I thank you, Lord, that today you're going to do a work in every heart and every life. That there's going to be a restoration take place. That there's going to be a reviving of our souls, Lord Jesus. That our spirits, Lord, will have the joy of the Lord. And that's our strength. And we give you all the praise. Anoint your word in Jesus' name. You may be seated. Amen. I'm going to speak to you today from 2 Kings chapter 3. I'm going to start off with 15 through 17. Our ushers are waving the offering bags. Come on down. Hurry, guys. Pick it up. We have already prayed, and you may now wait on them for the offering. Amen. This is your tithe and offering. We thank you for your giving to the ministries of this church, and we just pray God's blessings upon you as you support Assembly at Augusta. Amen? So turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings chapter 3, verses 15 through 17. And I'm going to read a couple of verses, and then I'm going to explain a Bible story that some of you will be familiar with. And I love the Old Testament. I love when you can dig on these words and how they bring life to my, my spirit. So this morning I want to begin with this scripture. It says, but now bring me a musician. And when the musician played, the hand of the Lord came upon him. And he said, thus says the Lord, make this valley full of ditches. For thus says the Lord, you shall not see wind or rain, yet the valley shall be filled with water. Say filled with water. So that you shall drink both you and your cattle and the other animals. This is but a simple thing in the sight of the Lord. I'm going to repeat that. This is but a simple thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver over the Moabites into your hand. When you look at the beginning of this word, it's a prophetic word being given by the prophet Elisha. And when you look at this where he called for the musician, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, but the word hand there, when it says the hand of the Lord came upon him to bring forth the spoken word. And that word hand means strength. And that word hand means power. And he was going to anoint the man of God to bring forth the spoken word. In the beginning of this chapter, we read where three kings were coming together. They were Jehoram, the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, and the king of Edom. They were coming together to fight against the Moabites because the Moabites had rebelled against the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. And the reason for that, that is Jehoram was Ahab's son, and he reigned over the northern part of the kingdom. And he wasn't as wicked as his mother and father, but he was still, the Bible says he did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Moabites had to pay like a tax to the northern kingdom. So when Ahab died, they said, we're not going to pay this tax anymore. So Jehoram decided he would gather three kings, and they were going to go after the Moabites and take what was theirs. So they took a trip. It was a seven-day journey through the wilderness of Edom. And while on this journey, they, the Bible calls it a roundabout. They went around about for seven days in the hot desert. There was no water. They were on the brink of war, and they were at the border of Moab. These folks, this army was weak. They were frail. They were dehydrated. Their animals were dehydrated. Then they had to be asking the question, how can we go to war when we're so weak and we have no strength? We're fixing to face the enemy, and we're hot and we're tired. The king of Israel, Jehoram, came. And, you know, don't you know that there's always somebody going to come up with a negative word? Anytime you're going through your stuff, your trials, your circumstance, somebody's going to come with a negative word. So here comes Jehoram with a negative word. And this is what he said. He began to speak a word of doubt. He said, God is going to deliver us over to our enemies, into the hands of our enemies. This, it was a word of doubt. It was a word of defeat. It was a, a word of destruction. And it was a word of death. 
Everybody say word of death. But my Bible says that the king of the southern kingdom, King Jehoshaphat, asked, Is there not a prophet of the Lord here that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And this king of Judah, Jehoshaphat, he understood that they were on the verge of a war. He understood that they didn't have enough men in their army, that they were weak, tired, thirsty, and no water. Say no water. If you sit there and stare at me this morning, I will take forever. If you say amen, I'm going to get through with this message. Can you say amen? Amen. I'm really not going to take a long time. He understood all of this, but then I love it because he also understood. This is important. That if the prophet gave a word from the Lord, a word in due season, a timely message, a word out of his mouth, and that the word of the Lord would change and shift the atmosphere over the wilderness. Anytime we speak the word of God, it changes the atmosphere. Punch your neighbor and say, the word changes things. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Oh, the word from the Lord would win them the war. The word of the Lord is so mighty and so powerful. When it's spoken, I don't care what war you're in, you're going to win the battle. The victory is the Lord's. Yes, the victory is the Lord's. I love that song, by the way. When we're going to war, the word from the Lord is going to release power into our situation. See, my Bible tells me in Hebrews 4.12 that it's powerful. The word of the Lord is powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. That word two-edged means twice, mouthed, language. The word of the Lord spoken. And then it also says the word of the Lord would do what only the word of the Lord could do. I'm telling you, you might be here this morning and you might have found yourself in a wilderness and things, the situation might look a little impossible to you. But there's such a thing as the living word that will bring us hope. And it'll be the anchor of our souls. I've been taught since I was a baby that the word of the Lord is the anchor of my soul. So I've learned to stand on that word and declare that word and see it work. I don't know about you, but I need a word. I was set, telling the 830 group this morning that when I was a little girl, I used to be in Sister Helen Worm's Sunday school class, and Sister Ivy Lee Jones would play the piano, and we would sing the B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the word for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. Come on, say it. The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the word for me. I stand alone on the word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. I need the word. I need the living word. The Logos word is the written word. But you see, when you speak the Logos word out of your mouth, what happens? It births the rhema word, which is the living word that changes the situations you're in. Things can't stay the same when you you begin to speak the living word because everything has to shift it has to change it has to bow at the name of Jesus which is the living word hallelujah John 1 1 says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God when we're walking in our times that things are seem confusing and major chaos going in our lives the word's going to turn things around and change it we don't have to reason with God God doesn't want us to reason with him let me tell you something he wants to reveal to us who he is and the power and the authority that you and I have as believers today as we walk things out. In Genesis 1-1, the word, it reminds us that the word will take the dead things and bring life. In the beginning it says, Woo, I feel the Holy Ghost. I've been so weak today, I didn't know if I was going to make it here this morning, but when I stand here, I just feel a wave after wave of the Holy Spirit. Genesis 1-1, 
In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was formless. It was void. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. The darkness had to disappear. In verse 16 on down, on the fourth day, it reminds us of how God created the greater light and the lesser light, which is the sun and the moon and the stars. But see, that wasn't created to day four. On the first day, when he was going to divide and make day and night. But on the first day, it was darkness. On the first day, it was without form. It was void, but out of his mouth, he spoke the word. And the word brought light. And what I'm telling you here this morning is the Logos word birthed the rhema word and he breathed on it. The scripture says the Holy Spirit was hovering over the face of the earth. And he breathed on that spoken word. And when he breathed on the spoken word, it brought light. It brought life. When he breathes on you this morning, in your situation, it brings life. That spoken word. So our responsibility is we have to speak it. Amen. Because it's mighty. Breakthrough. You want to know how breakthrough comes? It comes when a sound is made. When you open your mouth and you speak the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 1.12 says, as we open our mouth... And we speak the word of the Lord. It says in Jeremiah 1.12, my mama quoted this to me yesterday. He watches over his word to perform it. Oh, he watches over his word to perform it. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. It's his word that brings power. His word that brings life. And he's watching over it to make sure that that word completes the work he's begun in you and me. Somebody ought to. Hallelujah. Jesus. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that the word is inspired. That word means it's breathed on. Huh? God breathed. Inspired. God breathed word. So we have to declare his word. We don't have to come begging. I don't, you know, somebody said, I've been begging God. I've just been praying over and over that his will be done and begging him to do this and this. You don't have to beg God. My friend, you don't beg him, you declare it. Sickness leaves my body. Cancer dies at the root. Parkinson's disease is healed in Jesus' name. Heart trouble has to go and in Jesus' name. If he has to create a new heart, diabetes has to go in Jesus' name. So you start declaring the word of the Lord that by his stripes you are healed. That The Bible says in James, I don't remember the reference because I'm old. It says that he wishes for all of us that we be in good health. And that we prosper even as our soul prospers. He wants your soul to be alive. He wants your spirit to be awakened. He, because the word will wake it up. Let me tell you, you will prosper in all your ways. I'm not talking just physically. I'm, I'm talking physical, spiritual, emotional, mentally, financially, in all your ways. You will prosper. Y'all don't believe it, you hypocrites. <laughs> I have to just say that. You know that, right? Oh, hallelujah. We don't come begging but declaring. I've had a phrase that I've been saying through all this situation we've been going through, Miss Pauline. I'm standing. I'm worshiping. And I'm watching as God fights the battle. Because let me tell you something. I didn't say this at 830. And I'm trying to stay on target. But this is what I know. Before I ever found out anything was wrong with me, I like to put in my little ear things that my husband gave me. What are they called? Airpods. Airpods. (laughs) I call them headphones. (laughs) Because I'm what? I'm old. I'm on Medicare, (laughs) y'all. 
Hey, thank God for Medicare. I'm not just saying that. Thank God for Medicare during this time. I can tell you that right now. Uh, but anyway, my side rabbit trail here is this. The, on Sunday night, we had been in church at 8 30 and 10 45 and I think Baxter preached that day and we went home and we always chill out on Sunday nights I had some worship music going in my ear Pastor Brandon Lord said get up and go in your room and I want you to worship in there and he he had gotten on the phone I went he goes he nods his head I really don't think he knew what I was saying but (laughs) anyway and the reason I'm sharing this with you is how important it became to me. Because I am a worshiper and I love to spend that time in the presence of the Lord. But I went in my room and I was sitting in a chair and I was declaring the word. And I had some music on and I was worshiping. And the Lord said, Rebecca, stand up and dance. Now, before you criticize me. <laughs> Hank, watch it. Before you criticize me, I stood up. And so I'm kind of shondalon, you know, <laughs> waltzing a little bit. The Lord said, I said, dance. Dan, well, do you know how hard that is? <laughs> so I began to <laughs> do my thing, and I was worshiping, and what happened? Something released in my spirit. Now, this is before I knew anything. I didn't find out to the following evening. But I was worshiping, and the Lord, I said, Lord, I'm offering it up to you as a sweet sacrifice to you, a, a, a time of worship to you. See, worship is your greatest weapon. When you're, whatever you're going through, worship is your, it is the most awesome weapon you have. You combine it with the word. I mean, you, you, you like, who are those people, the ninja people? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 119, 89 says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. In other words, it is standing firm and it's unchangeable. We are, see, you and I need to make sure that the enemy knows our identity. We're sons and daughters of the king. We're sons and daughters with authority. When we speak his word, things have to shift and change. Uh, We used to sing a long time ago a song that says, Oh yes, oh yes, I'm a child of the king because his royal blood now flows through my veins. Let me tell you something. I am of the lineage of Christ. And because of him because of the power of his blood and the power of his word I have authority I am an heir of Christ and I have authority as his son and his daughter hallelujah when you are when you're standing in your wilderness you're blessed as you stand when you stand your children are blessed and your children's children are blessed because let me tell you why listen very carefully when you stand And you worship that what the enemy has meant to destroy in your life and in your family's life. Every curse, generational curse that has come down your family line because of Jesus. Because of the spoken word. You can start declaring the word. And that word breaks every generational curse off of you. The Stanley generation curses have been broken. The Moore generation curses have been broken. The Brookshire curses have been broken. They have no effect on me. You understand what I'm saying? But they have no effect on you and your children and your children's children. You have to stand and take authority. It'll be broken off your family. You'll become free. Free to praise. Free to worship. Because the rhema word has set you free. Hallelujah. Galatians 4, 7 says, Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you're a son, then an heir through God. While you're in your wilderness, you have to learn to your identity. I am his child. I am a child of the great I am. I am a child of the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Galatians 2.20 says, 
I have been crucified with Christ. Romans 6, 2 and 3 tells us I've been baptized with Christ. Colossians 3, 1 says I have risen with Christ. Hallelujah. Your breakthrough this morning is not based on your condition. Your breakthrough this morning is based on your position. What is your position? What is your position? What is your position? It ain't about your condition this morning. It ain't about the lost kids. It's not about whether you're sick and dying. It's not about whether you have a heart condition. It's not about your lost loved ones coming in. I'm telling you, it's not the condition. It is the position. My position this morning, my posture is one that says right now that I am standing and I'm worshiping. And I'm seeking him. And I magnify his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The devil needs to know your position. He needs to know where you stand. I have to have a drink of water. You're so wonderful. Everybody wipe your forehead and say, thank you, God. I'm almost done. There's a story. I spoke... On this, in uh, a brother and sister Joyce and Sun Wong's house, on the story of Jehoshaphat in, ba- in battle. And he wanted to inquire of the Lord. I'm not going to tell the whole thing, I'm just going to tell you this one part. So the prophet Jehazel came. His name means seer, his name means vision- visionary, his name means the word of God. The man came and spoke the word, and this is what he said. Get in your position and stand and see the salvation of the Lord. For the battle is the Lord's, not yours. See, that's where I am. I'm watching him perform his word. Revelation 5.10 says, I'm ruling and I'm reigning with Christ Jesus See, I don't go to war on my own strength. I'm in war right now. I don't go to war in my own strength. I don't go to war in my own opinions. I ain't smart enough to come up with a plan by myself. I go to war with my worship. Hallelujah. I've been saying to myself, I declare that all things are possible. He's my shield. He's my buckler. He's a breath that I breathe. He's my daily bread. He's my healer. He's my king of kings. And he's my Lord of lords. When we look at Psalm 34, it says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And it goes on to say, I sought the Lord. And he answered me. And he delivered me from all of my fears. The rest of the story is this. Are you listening? Are you with me? Elisha gave the word of the Lord. He said, you aren't going to see the wind. You're not going to even see the rain. They're dying. They have no water. They need water in the hot desert. He said, you're not going to see the wind. And you're not going to see the rain. But the valley that you're in is going to be filled with water. He said, dig ditches. The army had to be saying, you're crazy. You're not a man of God. A man of God wouldn't tell us to dig ditches in the heat of the day. No water for ourselves or our animals. We're dying out here. We're weak. We have no strength. What are you you doing? But the prophet said, dig ditches. He said, the valley is going to be filled with water. What a step of faith. What a step of faith these folks had to take. This army that was weird, that was on the brink of war. This army that was right on the border of Moab. Fixing to confront the enemy. And they're thirsty and they're tired and they're hot and have no strength. And the prophet says, dig a ditch. Because the water's coming. Let me tell you something. John 7, 38 tells us that when the Holy Spirit comes, out of our bellies will flow rivers of living water. You know how believers survive? Holy Spirit. 
brings that refreshing water. It revives our soul. That's where I am. I'm digging ditches this morning because I'm making room for the Spirit of God to move and to give miracles, not just for myself. How foolish that would be. I want it for everybody in this room. He's no respecter of persons. I'm asking him to meet your need where you are, what you have need of in your life. You, some of you have been digging ditch, ditches for a long, long time for your family. And you haven't seen any results. And you keep digging and you're tired. And the Lord wants you to know, don't give up. Don't stop digging. Salvation is at hand. Deliverance is at hand. Those addictions have to die in Jesus' name. Homosexuality has to die in Jesus' name. Pornography has to die in Jesus' name. Sickness has to die in Jesus' name. See, that's the God we serve. But our assignment is to dig. Hallelujah. The Bible says that they dug the ditches in obedience to the word of the Lord. And then, of all things, see, when God gives a word, he watches over his word to perform it. The Bible says that there was a downpour in the mountains of Edom. They didn't see it. They didn't feel the wind blowing. But there was a downpour. In the mountains of Edom. And that water began to to flow from that mountain and fill the ditches. The Bible goes on to say that after the morning sacrifice, the enemy, the Moabites, they looked down and they saw the ditches filled with what they thought was blood. Because as the sun was shining on the ditches, they looked red as if it was filled with blood. Listen, they thought, we have the victory. Those three kings have turned on themselves and fought each other and they killed one another. And now we'll go take the plunder. But guess what? <laughs> they with the Moabites went down to gather the plunder. And as they got down to the ditches, the Lord, it wasn't, it wasn't blood, it was water. Water that had revived the army. And sustained the army to take the enemy. Are you listening? That was delivered into the hands of the king. Just like he said, I will deliver the enemy into your hand. See, I got to tell you something. I'm, I'm expecting to be healed. Now, I don't know why God, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm human. I don't want to go through any of this. I don't want to have my breast removed. It went from one diagnose to another. I don't want to do that. But can I tell you something? I'm expecting healing and the cancer to go. But if he doesn't heal me, I'm still digging. I'm still worshiping because he's God. See, that's the thing. I have peace in my spirit because of who I serve. I'm not, I'm, I'm not in doubt here. Don't go, oh, Lord. She, no, I'm not in doubt. Do you know I had people calling me, Pauline, and saying, are you all right? I know you're probably depressed. The first person that said that to me, can I be honest, and y'all not get upset with me? First person that said that to me, and they're not in here. The first person that said that to me, something came over, Sister Rebecca. <laughs> My flesh rose up. You see this shovel? It's a good thing they weren't there. I said, depressed? I said, I'm not depressed. You're not depressed? I'm going to tell you, this was a pastor's wife from another city. She goes, well, I've been coming against depression because I felt you were depressed. And I don't want you to get so depressed that you just keep making it. Sister Rebecca, I said, baby, I am not depressed. I don't like it. And the devil's going to pay me back for this. There's a thing called recompense. I'm getting recompense for this. But this is what I say in my spirit. All is for his glory. All is for his name. You hear what I'm saying? There's a song that says that, and it's been in my spirit for weeks now. All, can I just tell you, my life, I want it to be for his glory. I want to represent who he is well. I'll tell you, I met some people the other day. I, I'm going to come to this. I'm going to go ahead and tell this real quick. 
see, the water is coming in my life and in yours. And I know you're here this morning, and I, I'm not up here to tell you all the gory details of what's going on with me, but I, I have to test. Can I testify just a second? See, God, he looks out for his people. Everything would t- told me the first time around, oh, this is an easy fix. We got this, Rebecca. You're good. And then there was a question. And they said, we're, my doctor said, I'm not really happy with these results. So you're going for an MRI. Y'all, I'm claustrophobic. And if my hair's touching the top of a machine, Hank, <laughs> I'm not a happy person because I can't lift my head. I'm on my stomach and my arms are this way. I've got to tell you how God works, though. I was very anxious about it. Baxter prayed with me before we went. My family was praying, you've got this. God's going to take you through this. Well, I was all gung-ho until I walked in and saw it. And I said, Jesus, I can, I fit, my, my little grandson Malachi would have thought it was a rocket. And he would have been excited, but Nana wasn't so excited. And I walked in the hospital, and I heard somebody say, Miss Rebecca. And I turned, and there was Hank. Now, Laura, i got to tell you something. Your husband was a godsend. I said, well, hey. I said, what are you doing here? He goes, I do MRIs. And I went, <laughs> can you do mine? Come on. He, listen, it was God. Now, I'm going to just tell you, it was God. He said, let me see what I can work out. His little assistant, the nurse, she helped me get all situated. Here comes Hank. You ready, Miss Rebecca? And I was nervous, but they stuck me in the machine. And immediately, I said, take me out. Pull me back out immediately. And poor old Hank comes back in there. He goes, you all right, Miss Rebecca? I said, no, I'm not. I, I, I can't be shut up in this thing. My head's touching the top of this. If you'd left me down here, I'd be all right. But you're pulling me all the way up here. And I'm a wimp. I'm just going to tell you. And I looked at him, and I said, let me tell you how God puts believers in your path to help you through these times. I said, Hank, I need prayer. I ain't going to be able to do this. I need you to pray for me. He goes, Miss Rebecca, you got it. And he said, and I'm going to pray for you. But then out of his precious mouth came these precious words to my ears. It was music to my ears. He said, do you want me to go get Pastor Stanley? Yes! (laughs) And they brought my husband in there. Now, he still made me, uh, y'all, can we give it up for Hank? Because he took care of me. And he's a great, a great man of God, and his lovely wife is because of her, okay? <laughs> and we know the truth. Um, and if you don't know, he helps with Royal Rangers, and he's an awesome teacher. But he, he comforted my heart. But in the middle of that, they made me lay back out, put my arms out. But I could look down in this mirror, and I could see that face. (laughs) And he took my hand, and he's holding my hand. Now, I nearly squeezed his hand off. But he encouraged me, and he would say things to me as it would change and, and whatever the next phase was. I mean, you're sitting there. You don't know what's going on. You're like, Jesus, what are they seeing? What are they finding? And my husband said, you got it. God's going to help you. And he encouraged me. Now, I didn't like the news they gave me. And I know he knew, but so gracious and loving toward me to help me get from that, okay? So I give him kudos. But listen to this. When you're walking through your wilderness, and I don't know what yours is, I don't know what situation you faced. Some of you have been in this, in this room have been sick for a mighty long time. Some of you have been praying and believing for God to heal you. Others of you, you have situations going on in your family that I don't understand and I don't, I don't know all the details. But what I do know is what this prophet said came to pass that God said he would deliver them, the enemy, into their hands. When the hand of God comes on his word, the spirit makes that, the word come alive. And the power and the authority that you and I have in the word, that's what we have as our defense. And see, the devil's a liar. Now, I'm going to just tell you right now, I tell him every day, you are a liar. 
I, I, I'm for myself. And Charity, I'm praying for your mama because she's walking through the same thing. Let me tell you something. She needs to declare the word over herself. But my daughter would take her hands and put them on me every day and say, I curse that cancer to the root. And she would tell Malachi, and Jeremiah wasn't so much into it, <laughs> but she would tell Malachi, lay hands on Nana. And they lay hands on Nana and pray. And they would say these words, be made whole in Jesus' name. My grandson, Nikolai, was taking a shower, playing like all little boys play in the shower. And he loves to play with his toys in the bathtub. Stood up and his mama heard him say, Nana, rise up and get in position like the Lord told you to do. <laughs> and then he started back playing. I mean, he, listen, I believe it was a word from God. I went, oh, out of the mouth of babes. And the reason I shared that with you is, yeah, it encouraged my heart, but it's helped me be able to stand on the promises. Come to the, come to, where are you? Get up here, girl. <laughs> Kellen's pregnant. She's going to birth something in the natural, but this church is birthing things in the spirit. You hear what I'm saying? The Logos word births the rhema word, which is alive. I want them to play that song again. Now, there's something I have for you. Ushers, if you'll come, um, get those things right there, baby. Well, you're the baby for me, <laughs> I think. Are you still my baby? <laughs> Give that to I need some more ushers down here. See, one thing I wanted today, I asked my husband if I could share with you. Because everybody's asking questions, and I know I can't thank you enough for your prayers. I want you to stand with me. Some of you have sent me messages every day of encouragement. But listen to this. Our fight is with weapons unseen. Your enemies crash to their knees as we rise up in worship. When trials unleash like a flood, the battle belongs to our God as we rise up. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Because the victory is yours. You're riding on the storm. Your name is unfailing. Though kingdoms rise and fall, your throne withstands it all. Your name is unshaken. I have to read the second verse. Look at me. I know you're looking at me, but I'm just saying that. What hell meant to break me has failed, devil. Now nothing, I don't care what condition I'm in, Karen, I don't care. I'm going to praise. I'm going to praise. I am not going to shut my mouth. I'm going to worship. What hell meant to break me has failed. Now nothing will silence my praise because I cry out, cry out in worship. The walls of prison will shake. The chain-breaking king will rise to save as we cry out. But listen to the next part. You roar like thunder. Nothing can tame God all-powerful. Are you listening, church? Dig your ditch. Dig your ditch. The water's coming. Are you listening? The refreshing, reviving, restorating power of the living water is flowing over us today. We're digging ditches. We're expecting the water to come. And when the water comes, we're refreshed. We're made strong. And we can do this. What are you going through this morning? Where are the ushers? They've already done it? Wow. Thank you, guys. These little, these are little shovels. And you might think I'm silly. I'm all about visual. <laughs> Bethany told me yesterday, she said, I still have my rock. I still have my key. And Pauline told me she still had her little vessel thing from years ago. The shovel is a reminder. Dig the ditches. Dig the ditches. I'm going to say it one more time. Dig the ditches. Expect your miracle. Come on, guys. Sing that song. I want you to worship with everything in you. You can move this. 
Worship with everything in you this morning. And we're going to declare the word of the Lord. Sing it. The victory is yours. You're riding on the storm. Your name is unfailing. No kingdoms rise and fall. Your throne withstands it all. altar area as far over to that way and this way and down the aisles because you're stepping in faith see you stepping out as a step of faith a step of belief come on down come on quickly move it sing it the victory
so why dig ditches? Because you got to make a place for the blessing. And see, when you dig the ditch, it's that not only are you making a place for the blessing, but you're directing the path of the blessing. And Rebecca, this hit me. I heard you preach this this morning at 8.30, but it hit me when you did this. The very same thing that blessed God's people brought confusion and defeat to the enemy. That's why he says, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. God's in charge. He's got this. Now, I want you to understand something. We are not in denial. I, didn't I see Rick? Where's Rick? Years and years ago, when Rick was walking through this with Doris, Rick's, if you could call it a mantra, I, I don't mean it in the Eastern sense, but he, well, his battle cry was, we treat aggressively and we believe aggressively. And there's no contradiction. Now, again, I'm going to reiterate what Rebecca said. Don't you waste a nanosecond feeling sorry for her or for me. God gave me the most awesome wife that I could possibly ever have, and she's still my awesome wife. And I want you to, I, you need to hear, I want you to hear some stuff. We're not going to talk about this a lot, so he, listen, you know, it's like the old thing on Hee Haw. We, we ain't once go around repeating gossip, so make sure you listen close the first time. Here's the thing. My wife is under no pressure to do anything for me. Are you hearing me? And, and, and God's going to help her to make the most informed decisions. And He's going to tell her what to do. And what she's going to do is she's going to live and not die. And she's going to declare the glory of God. I, you know, and the, I'll tell you something that this has made very real to me. You know that every time, almost every time I leave com communion, most of the time when I leave communion, I tell you, when we talk about the bread, it's for our healing. And I've encouraged you to do this. Thank God for your healing, even if you don't have a diagnosis, because this was going on before it was diagnosed. Thank God for your healing every day. He is your healer. He's healing you now. You, you have been healed. You are being healed, and you're going to be healed because that's who He is. Powerful, powerful word. She's going to preach me right out of a job. I told Brother Moore years ago this would happen. You know, powerful, powerful word. I, we, now, let me say this. I want to add my thanks. We're very serious about being grateful for Hank. And look, I don't want to embarrass you, but I've just watched Hank's posts on Facebook, and sometimes it just literally stinks to do his job. Because I saw a post one time, he said, it's really hard to smile at someone who's gone through the procedure of getting an MRI and be cordial to them knowing that their brain looks like Swiss cheese. So here's what I'm saying. We need to pray for him and those that work. You know what else happened? We go in there, and the lady that's just doing all the paperwork to get the insurance lines up, she's saying, I'm praying for you, and you're going to be okay. She's a member of Curtis Baptist. She said, this is my ministry. This is what I do. And she said to Rebecca, she said, you are surrounded by believers who are praying for you. The, the Breast Health Center at University was started by Dr. Randy Cooper. Every woman in there, and that what they do is they kind of mentor you and walk, help you walk through the process. Every woman in there is a cancer survivor. Now, what, I, what are you saying, Pastor? Are you talking about faith or medicine? Again, we treat aggressively and we believe aggressively and we thank God for every person who has compassion and who gives courage and helps with every step of the way. God is faithful. God's faithful. So let, listen, we I'm speaking for Rebecca and me, and it's dangerous to speak for my wife. But above all, and I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do, and I've said this to the staff, so let me just say it to you guys. I'm going to be her husband. 
And that's going to take priority. There may be some things that you need out of me that are going to be on the back shelf. Just hang tight. I've always been a procrastinator anyway, so you ought to be used to it. Shouldn't be any big change. Pastor Brandon is, come up here. Cynthia, you too. These guys are more than capable, and they've got my back. And besides, we're a team. There's nothing that's happened since we've come together that's been him or me. We're a team. But he, listen, let me tell you, he's got broad shoulders. He can carry the load. He's going to tote the mail. I'm not going away. I'm going to do everything that I can. What I'm beginning to see in myself is that, first of all, I'm always a dreamer, and I love to plan things. Right now, I'm a little cloudy in that area. Uh, it's going it's to clear up quick. No, nope, no. Nope. The main thing is, I already said this to someone this morning, if you ask me a question and I answer you as if I'm not paying attention or if I've got a little edge in my tone, I'm not mad at you. I've just got my mind on her. And I think that's where it needs to be. So, uh, but above all, we don't want to be a distraction. Yes, ma'am. You're distracting me. Oh, this worship team is just kicking it. They're kicking it. And I, here's what I know. God's got this. You know, in my ministry, let me just say this to you, and then we'll let you go home. I'm going to act. No, you're not. You're going to go downstairs and eat spaghetti. That's next week? That's next. You mean there ain't no spaghetti today? Oh, God, baby, we got to get food. All right. Well, I was prepared to do my part. That's all I'm saying. In my, in my ministry... I, when you, I said there was a composer, an American composer, symphony composer named Aaron Copeland. If you had to take uh, humanities in school, you probably heard of Aaron Copeland. He's known as the great American composer. He was known for composing Western themes and soundtracks for a lot of huge movies. I'm talking about big movies. And he was being interviewed as he got older in life. And so this guy was saying, he says, Mr. Copeland, it appears that your music is divided up into three distinct phases. He said, well, it didn't feel that way. I can look back, though, now on my ministry, and I can see phases of my ministry. The first phase of my ministry was trying to lead young people. And Rebecca and I put our shoulder to the wheel and did all that we could in, in leading young people and doing music. The second phase of our ministry was to extend the ministry of my father-in-law. And that was a conscious decision led by the Holy Spirit and it ran from, uh, I guess, about 1993. Uh, to 2005 when he resigned and then he became my associate and I told him at that point I, and I told several of the, I even told the district leadership I said you know extending brother I, I, I did what I was supposed to do in extending his ministry and there's a part of me that feels like I've done my, my mission's complete almost like I could have retired and there was this little thing called money <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I really felt that was a season that, that was a season and it came to a close. Then the next thing was, all right, Lord, what do you have for me? And quite honestly, the next thing was move this church to Columbia County. And you heard the announcement last week. Uh, we, we have a buyer for downtown. Now, I'm going to be, you know, I really want, we want to be responsible and careful. The fact is, closing is, I had hoped it was a little bit sooner, but closing is the 30th of this month at 3 o'clock. And, uh, and man, I'm going to be so happy. We're going to close. There's a whole part of me that feels like this is God cleaning up my mess. <laughs> and, of course, Manuel's helping clean up my mess, too. We, uh, and yeah, give some love. Manuel, raise your hand. He's got a crew, and they've been down at the old, and we, I, do you know, how many containers have you hauled off so far? Five 40-yard containers. Think of driving, uh, think of pulling up uh, five uh, tractor trailers, basically, and hauling them to the dump. We left a lot of stuff in there, and it ain't clean. <laughs> Stuff has happened. But that's a phase that honestly, as of March the 30th, I mean, I know it happened when we merged, but I'm just saying as far as that being gone and clear and free, then that's another phase 
of my ministry. And you say, well, now you can retire. No. The next thing is for Pastor Brandon and me to turn this thing over to the younger generation. Now, I'm not trying to dictate your ministry, but he's 15 years younger than me. And I honestly believe it's in the plan of God that now, see, we can either, we can either make this a museum for me and my guys. And that's, I mean, that's, museums are not generally crowded, guys. You know what I'm saying? And so I believe that just like God has provided the strength and the insight for all of the other phases, he's going to provide strength and insight and resources for this. And I'm going to tell you where it shows up is when my wife has a battle to fight and I can step aside and be there with her and everything keep on going. You see, I, I want you to understand something about my relationship with you. We have a love relationship, not a codependent relationship. I don't need for you to need me for me to feel okay. If the only way you get self-worth is because you're meeting somebody's need, you're not in love, you're sick. And there's help, I'm not making fun of you. I just saw, it's amazing to me how many people don't realize that. But healthy is when I can step aside and the church can go on. Now, I again, can we give some love to Rebecca? I, what a wonderful word. She's telling me to shut up. That's code, that's code for I did my job, I want to go eat. The other thing that keeps happening to me, there, hey, hey guys, there's another major part of my ministry. I cannot tell you how many times that I've left town to do something and revival breaks out <laughs> I, was just late. I gotta get out of the way blessing but uh, a couple of times lately people that I knew when I was younger came to church Tony Henderson came and I was out of town I, miss, I can't believe I missed Tony Henderson now you didn't know I ain't got time to tell you what Tony means in my life but then my other buddy last week Steve Snyder showed up I'm not in church here comes Steve and boy did he brag on Pastor Brandon's preaching and now I'll tell you something. Stop the stream. I don't want this to go 